Okay, so um, our next speaker is actually from the same lab. So it's William Podlaski from um, Christian Mack's lab. We already heard um, some of his work in the previous talk. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to hear now more about your current work on um, storing overlapping associative memories on latent manifolds in low rank spiking networks. Hey, hi everyone. Thanks so much for the intro and uh, thanks to the organizers and the attendees who voted for giving me the opportunity to share this work. Um, I, I think it's very fitting that I'm going after my advisor, Christian, and I'm hoping that people have just watched that talk because I'm gonna take the opportunity to assume a bit more background knowledge than usual. So I'm gonna be talking about a particular application of the low rank spiking network framework that Christian just presented, uh, specifically to storing associative memories. So let's get into it. So just a quick recap of the, the Hopfield model and associative memory. So the Hopfield model has been uh, in the news lately because of the Nobel Prize. And I guess would say that it's one of the most influential models in neuroscience as well as an uh, early model of AI. Um, and the original model, just to recap, uh, is a model of binary neurons. So Here's a recurrently connected network of five neurons. The neurons will, will have values of plus one or minus one for active or inactive. Um, and each neuron is essentially just doing a weighted sum uh, of its inputs from other neurons in the network and then passing it through a sign function that turns that into a plus one or minus one. So I guess one of the main insights that Hopfield had was that uh, this type of network can, can be understood as having an energy function which is illustrated here in this, this nice illustration from the, uh, I guess, coming from some write-up of the Nobel Prize recently. Uh, so what's nice about this is you can imagine initializing the network in a particular state, which is uh, illustrated by dropping this ball into this energy landscape. Um, so we have an input pattern that maybe is close to uh, a stored pattern. And then the network kind of evolves and this ball rolls through the energy landscape and falls into a, uh, a low energy state. And that happens to correspond with this letter J, which is one of the stored patterns. OK, so uh, just a little bit more uh, background before we get to spiking networks. So uh, over the years, uh, there's been many proposals for how to, how to store memories in these types of networks. Um, so, so the aim is to store a set of P memory patterns. Um, here's an example. So we have these uh, five neurons and three memory patterns uh, where we have plus one and minus one for each of the neurons, and essentially, the way to store these memories is uh, is to put them into the synaptic weights. So Hopfield himself proposed a Hebbian-like rule. Um, so I'm going to call the the memory patterns by this. I'm going to denote them by xc. So essentially, you can store uh, the memories by uh, by defining the synaptic connections between any two neurons i and j uh, as proportional to the activity that they have in the pattern. So for example, this neuron is plus one, and it has a neighbor that's also active at plus one. So these neurons will have a positive weight. Uh, these two neurons will have a negative weight, and so on. And then you kind of sum this over all the patterns that you're storing. So this type of learning rule has a linear scaling with the number of neurons in the network, but it's relatively small. And over the years, this has been improved. I'm just going to give a couple other examples that will come up later when I start talking about the spiking network. And uh, I don't want to dwell on the equations. They're not super important. It's just for the aficionados in the audience. Um, but one way you can improve uh, storage in a sort of Hebbian-like way is by decorrelating the patterns. This is sometimes called a pseudo-inverse rule, where you include a term that, that uh, relates to the correlation between the patterns. And then finally, the maximum uh, number of patterns you can store if you optimize all the weights and make the weights uh, fully asymmetric is uh, you can store a number of patterns that approaches two times the network size. So uh, in this one, there's a way of understanding the solution of, of the weights as being in a set of inequalities. Again, not, not super important, but uh, I'm, if I have time, I'll, I'll discuss how this relates to the, the spiking solution. So overall, uh, there's many solutions for learning the weights in these types of networks. Um, that, that lead to linear scaling with the, the number of neurons. So what about spiking, uh, spiking memory? So 
uh, I think since the 80s, people have built many, many models and published many results on this. I'm going to do a little bit of a cop out and, you know, I should be referencing many papers here. I'm just going to cite this textbook from Wolfram Gerstner as a nice uh, resource that discusses this, which is already 10 years old. Uh, but I think overall, I would summarize these previous results as being being very nice, very promising, um, but they often apply in, in limited cases. So they don't have a direct mapping, for example, to the original Hopfield model, but they, they require, for example, having sparse patterns and large networks. Um, and often they use approaches like mean field theory. So spiking variability is often just seen as noise in those types of models. Um, so I would argue that there's still room for, uh, for some improvement here. And um, there's no general framework for mapping, for example, the original Hopfield model to spiking networks. So I'm going to propose today a, a new solution that's based on uh, the framework that, that was presented also in the previous talk. So again, as I said, I'm, I'm going to assume that, that people have just come from seeing that previous talk, and um, I'm going to summarize it here. So if you haven't watched that, then hopefully, uh, then maybe you're, you're watching on this on YouTube and you can uh, watch that. But basically what we have is, uh, what we're, we're using is a geometric framework for building dynamics into low rank uh, spiking networks. So these are networks of integrated and fire neurons. And the, the network is schematized here. And the important constraint that we put on the network is that we use low rank connectivity. So the network has uh, recurrent weights W, and we factorize those weights into two rectangular matrices, E and D, that stand for encoder and decoder. And so in this schematic, we have these five neurons um, here. And essentially, as, as uh, was explained in the other talk, um, we can understand this low rank connectivity as first decoding the activity of these neurons into a, a, a low dimensional set of variables, of latent variables that, are, that I'll call Y. And then this activity is encoded through the encoder matrix back into the inputs that these neurons have. Um, and what's nice about this type of framework is that we can then visualize what the network is doing in, a, in latent space. And as Christian showed, um, what, what the network is going to do is that it's going to situate activity on a manifold. And this manifold is going to separate an area of the latent space where many neurons are active and an area where all of them are inactive. Um, and if, uh, if we set the constraints up correctly, we can basically build a, a network that has a stable boundary. So uh, similar to most of Christian's talk, I'm going to be focusing on all inhibitory networks that are spontaneously active, um, because it's sort of the, the simplest case of getting a stable boundary with this type of um, framework. But feel free to ask about how this can apply to other networks. Um, it, we are. We're not limited to all inhibitory networks. It's just that they're the, the easiest uh, types of networks to understand. So again, the main takeaway is just that when we decompose the weights into these two components, we can separate the contributions of the manifold geometry, so how this manifold looks in the space, and then the dynamics that we can build on top. So I was going to show the same video that Christian showed, but I ended up using a PDF of my slides. So I'm going to skip that. Um, but basically, now. Now the task is to start thinking about the Hopfield network and associative memory. So we have basically two steps to go through. The first one is designing the shape of the manifold. So that's choosing the encoding weights. And then after that, we'll move on to the decoding weights. So in order to do that, we can go back to the binary Hopfield network and notice that the Hopfield patterns can be understood as being the vertices of a hypercube. So for example, for a two-dimensional network, we just have a square. And uh, there's four possible patterns that can be stored, which is just plus or minus one for each of the neurons. Um, and that's that forms the four vertices of this square. In 3D, we get eight vertices. And this can be extended to, to higher dimensions. So what's nice about visualizing the Hopfield network in this way is that it already gives us an idea of a manifold that we can use to store the patterns. So we can actually use a hypercube as the, as the manifold uh, where the neurons are organized around. So essentially, going back to the 2D picture, we can arrange the neurons um, as vertical and horizontal lines in this space, which is determined by their encoding vectors. And then they will form basically a square. And in higher dimensions, they'll form a cube and a hypercube and so on. 
So that gives us a very nice, straightforward way of, of writing the encoder part of our recurrent weights. So here, red is indicating plus one, and blue is indicating minus one. So basically, a network of 10 dimensions, 10 latent dimensions, will be composed of 20 neurons. And each neuron I, only cares about one of the 10 dimensions with either a weight of plus one or minus one, which will form the faces of the cube. OK, so that's essentially the, the neural manifold. Unlike the previous talk, we're now not dealing with smooth manifolds, but now we have a sort of a higher dimensional manifold um, where each neuron is only caring about one of the dimensions. Then uh, we can basically uh, choose different vertices of this manifold to be our patterns. So in a k-dimensional latent space, we have two to the k vertices, uh, just the same as the Hopfield network. We have two to the k patterns. So we just choose some vertices, and we assign them to be the patterns that we want to store. Um, and importantly, uh, there's two notions of patterns in the space. So there's the latent pattern, which is uh, which I'm going to call xc, which is essentially the coordinates of the latent space. In this case, we have plus one, minus one, plus one. And then there's actually the neural pattern, which is which neurons actually make up this vertex. In this case, it happens to be, so there's six faces, so six neurons in this 3D latent space, and three of the six neurons are active. And these, uh, these different patterns are related through this uh, decoding matrix. OK, so that's the step one, designing the neural manifold. And now uh, you have to speed up a bit because there is also just two minutes. Uh, okay, left. two minutes left. Okay, oops. Okay, I'll go a bit faster. So our second step is designing the manifold dynamics. Um, and essentially, to do this very quickly, I'm going to choose one of the vertices of this square, and we're going to ask how do we stabilize the dynamics on this vertex. So we can notice that um, the latent dynamics here are composed of two pieces. So we have a leak minus y that's trying to bring the dynamics to the origin. And then we have the effects of spikes, which is each spike moves the dynamics in the direction of these decoding vectors. And essentially, what's happening at this vertex is it's going to be the sum of the decoders of all the neurons that are active at this vertex. So we essentially have the sum of these two black arrows. And if we match those black arrows to be counteracting the leak, then this ends up becoming a stable fixed point. And one way we can write this is that our pattern in latent space, so y, has to be equal to the decoders times the pattern in neural space. So um, this ends up being the objective of our uh, of our dynamic. And we can then write uh, several learning rules that, that accomplish this. So one thing we can do is we can actually map uh, Hebbian and pseudo-inverse learning rules into, into the decoding weights. So we, here we can see that we get a term that looks a lot like the Hebbian outer product of the Hopfield network that's then passed through the encoding matrix. And then we can also do a pseudo-inverse rule by incorporating the correlation of the patterns. And then lastly, we can also think about doing an asymmetric learning rule by directly optimizing this objective function. So that ends up looking like um, this sort of constrained optimization problem here, where we constrain the decoding weights to exactly satisfy um, this constraint for all of our patterns. OK, so that's, uh, that's how we set up the decoding weights. And now uh, we can see if this works. So I'm just going to show a couple of quick examples. Um, first, I'm going to start with looking at this asymmetrically optimized weights in a small network of 20 neurons with four patterns. So I'll show you a spike raster, firing rates, and latent states. And then I'm also going to show the overlap uh, both in rate space and in latent space. So that's basically the cosine similarity of the, neural, the neuron's rates with a pattern in rate space, and then the cosine similarity of the latent space with each of the patterns. So we act. So I basically initialize the network close to one of the patterns, and you can see that it forms uh, this sort of stable spike sequence that's continuing to fire. Some of the rates uh, are elevated, other ones are at zero, and then the latent states essentially divide into a scaled version of plus minus one. And one of the patterns has an ever elevated overlap, whereas the other ones are uh, closer to zero. We can do this for the other patterns, and we see that we get successful recall for all four of these patterns. Um, if we do this for the Hebbian matrix, it turns out it doesn't work very well. Um, and what we found, one interesting thing that we found from this work is that just a simple Hebbian rule isn't precise enough, actually, to stabilize patterns in this network. 
So lastly, I just want to show what happens when we scale this up. And so we took the pseudo inverse and optimized rules, and we simulated uh, a bunch of networks with many patterns, so with increasing uh, storage load, and measured the average overlap. And basically, the point at which this overlap starts to decrease is the maximum number of patterns that can be stored in the network, um, also known as the capacity. So what we found is that we, we have a linear scaling of the capacity of this network with uh, the network size. For the pseudo inverse rule, it was around 0.3. And for the optimized rule, it was around 0.5, which is quite a uh, substantial capacity, especially considering that um, all the patterns have around half of the neurons shared with any other given pattern. So it's a, a network that's storing very uh, overlapping patterns. OK, so I think for the sake of time, I'll skip this pattern completion part, but essentially we can also measure pattern completion in the network, and we see similar results to the Hopfield network. So uh, with that, I'll finish. So essentially what I've shown you here is an application of this uh, geometric approach to build uh, building interpretable dynamics, interpretable, sorry, dynamics into low rank spiking networks. Um, and it allows us to have a direct mapping to the Hopfield network. Um, and essentially what we've done is we've designed a manifold where we can store uh, attractors on the vertices of this sort of hypercubic manifold. And then we can think about how to get the dynamics to move towards the vertices. So there's a bunch of discussion points that I think I'll skip for the sake of time. Yeah, I think and we I should say start that... asking questions. There is uh, okay. only like two minutes left. Yeah. But, um, okay. For your uh, I'll, yeah, I'll finish there. Thank you. OK, so then the first question we have is from Rainer Engelken. And he asks, how does the spiking activity in your memory network compare with experimentally observed data, like in uh, PFC activity in memory tasks? Uh, interesting question. I don't specifically know how it compares with the, the particular task that you're thinking of. I would say that we, so we observed uh, some interesting phenomena that depending on the parameters and the number of memories stored in the network, sometimes we see very uh, rhythmic spiking patterns. So very reliable rhythmic spiking patterns where one neuron always spikes and that leads to another one. And other times we see much more variable spikes such that um, an attractor state can result in variability between the spikes that occur, but we haven't yet related it to data. Okay. Uh, then let's go to the next question. It's from uh, Michel uh, Nardin. Um, I might have missed it, but is there a way to define an energy for these networks and understand them in a classical Hopfield-like manner? Hmm. Uh, good question. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, for sure, I mean, for the symmetric case, there probably is, but I think the fact that they're spiking means that the activity is variable over time. So uh, it probably only makes sense to think about it in more of an average energy. Um, but I think it's a very it's a very nice question that we should probably explore further. Um, and then I think we go for one last question by uh, Daniel Schmid. Is it possible to store, spa store spacious temporal and not uh, non-stationary firing patterns like limit cycles? Uh, thanks. Also, a very nice question. Uh, for sure, it is. Um, actually, in the in the previous talk from Christian, he showed how you can you can uh, store a limit cycle in the network. And for sure, if we design the dynamics appropriately, we can have the dynamics jump between the vertices instead of staying at one vertex. So I think it's a pretty general framework to to store different types of dynamics. Thank you very much. I think um, we stop here with the questions and um, go we, can, we can run on a little bit more, I think, because the next session is, is a bit complicated to set up. So. Uh, OK, so then uh, we likely have time for the rest of the questions, it looks like. Um, so the next question is by uh, Nosra Chola. Is it uh, possible to include hierarchical patterns um, into these networks um, now that it it is using the concept of manifolds? Uh, I think I don't uh, understand exactly what the this person means by hierarchical patterns, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. Maybe they yeah, can. I, they I could can think clarify. maybe about. Yeah, maybe they can clarify in the chat and become back later. Or 
otherwise maybe they mean something like uh, patterns that um, belong to different categories and there are sub patterns in one of these categories I'm not sure whether this yeah it could be yeah i it's a it's a very interesting question i think i mean yeah i guess hierarchical has many meanings so um and i know that it's it's used to describe different types of associative memory but uh i'm not exactly sure okay why here so maybe let's wait if there is a clarification in the chat and otherwise in the meantime let's go on to julia's question um have you considered asymmetric learning rules and how would it affect learning uh yes thanks for the question uh so to clarify the actually i can are my slides still showing yes they're still there can okay but so this uh optimized learning rule shown here is actually an asymmetric rule so it's it doesn't assume symmetric connectivity and that actually is the rule that we found works the best um and that that said it's still it still finds solutions that are heavily symmetric it's just uh, that it allows for asymmetric connections. Okay. Um, and then the last question is from Aditi. Um, is there a way to know how connection probabilities change with number of patterns learned by the network? Um, yeah, I mean, so I would, I would say generally, there's a lot of interesting things to explore in the connectivity that we haven't done yet. Um, and I think thinking about connection strength and probability is an interesting one there. Um, the network that we end up with is all to all connected. So uh, generally speaking, there will always be a connection between neurons. Um, but we also have ideas about how to make it more sparse. Okay, so um, maybe is um, the flash talk session now ready? Or uh if it's not ready, it's very, very soon going to be ready. So I think we can close this session out. And okay. everyone just hang around for a few minutes. If you don't get immediately moved over to the next session, it won't be long. Then thank you again for the talk, Bill. It was really nice to hear about this. Thanks a lot. Yeah.